Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 362, I chat with Joe Kane, Jeff Tully, and Ron Williams about the recent QLED and HDR10 Summit. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded July 13th, 2017. Episode 362, QLED and HDR10 Summit. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week, I have three guest geeks joining me, all returning guest geeks. Uh, first up is Joe Kane. Hey, Joe, welcome back. Good to be here. Thanks. Uh, then Jeff Tully. Nice to see you, Jeff. Good to see you, too. Yeah. And finally, Ron Williams. Hey, Ron, welcome back. Scott. Um, those of you who are watching live at live.twit.tv, can join the chat room there or at irc.twit.tv and you can post questions as we go and I'll pass along as many as I can. So the reason I gathered this August group together uh, is that we were all attendees at the Samsung QLED and HDR10 Summit, which was a solid two days of super geek out mode. <laughs> and... Uh, we all thought, you know what, we should share this with the uh, Home Theater Geeks audience. So here we are to do exactly that. Uh, as the name implies, not so <laughs> indirectly, uh, the main topics of discussion were QLED and HDR10. Now we're going to start with QLED, which uh, is a term that Samsung uses to describe any TV that uses quantum dots. And I've had a number of people on the show in the past who come from companies that make quantum dots. And uh, it's, it's a pretty loose term, though, this QLED. They mean it to sort of be like OLED. But I think it's more, it's, it's less exact than OLED. Um, it really is more like LED TV. Uh, you guys, I'm sure, remember when, and I think it was Samsung that first did this, uh, started calling its LCD TVs with LED backlights LED TVs. Um, Joe, you must remember that some years ago, right? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I strenuously objected to when it was happening, it mm -hmm. was rather confusing. Very confusing. Uh, I agree with you completely because... To me, an LED TV is more like, you know, the jumbotron at a at a sporting stadium or the Fremont Street experience. If you're in Vegas and you go to Fremont Street, you see this giant thing overhead and it's actually LEDs producing the light directly. Uh, the image, I mean, directly, whereas in LED TVs, the LEDs are the backlight and it's still an LCD TV. Um, Ron, you must have felt similar uh, when, when that term came about, right? Oh, I, I objected big time to that. I just kept telling mm -hmm. everybody it's still an LCD TV, different mm -hmm. backlight. So yeah, why exactly. market what the backlight is when it's basically an LCD and the LCD TV still has all of the artifacts and the problems that we object to, but they're just going with a different backlight to give the contrast and color a little different. Uh, that would be the difference. But the fact is, you're still dealing with an LCD TV, mm -hmm. and it's got its problems. And, and so it does. And QLED is even more confusing because it could mean one of several different things. Uh, Jeff, don't, don't you think that that's more of a problem maybe than it's worth? Well, I, I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but right now we've got so much alphabet soup going on with you know even even HDR and HFR and UHD and the ultra of UHD. Uh, I think all all four of us could 
argue in favor of ultra being uh, a little bit less used as a resolution and more as a, a functionality but uh, mm. we, we don't we don't end up writing the marketing literature uh, <laughs> indeed still in all here we are we've got qled and it refers to any tv that uses quantum dots in any way <clears throat> the good news is that it's Samsung, I believe, acquired the use of that term when it bought QD Vision, one of the companies that makes quantum dots, and they had that term, and so Samsung got that term in the in the buyout. And uh, but they're making it free to use; anybody can use it if they want. Uh, so, you know, if that's a good thing or a bad thing, I don't really know. What I want to talk about today. Uh, what I want to start with, anyway, are quantum dots, because uh, we spend a lot of time at the summit uh, hearing about quantum dots and all the different ways that they could be used in a QLED TV. Um, so let's start with, with, with what they are. Let's, let's make a, uh, a review a little bit here about exactly what they are. Um, let's see, which of you would like to sort of start with uh, just sort of a basic description of, uh, of what, a, what is a quantum dot? Well, if I may, from the slide from our presentation, they say quantum dots and quantum rods mm. are nanoscale particles. And they're in two categories, the photoluminance and the electroluminance. So the photoluminance absorb blue light and readmit it in green or red, and the electro does, emits red, green, or blue light, uh, applying different currents, kind of like OLEDs do. Uh, right, exactly. Now, we have a, we, I have a picture of, of what a quantum dot looks like, and they could be rods as well, but mostly I think we're talking about spheres. So let's take a look at QD structure. And uh, we see here that it has a core, it has a shell, and it has what are, what are called surface ligands. And uh, the material <clears throat> that's used here is a semiconductor material. So it's kind of like a, a semicon. It, it is a semiconductor, like chips or transistors or whatever. Uh, and the typical uh, materials are cadmium selenide and indium phosphate. And man, oh man, I, my eyes started glazing over when they were getting in deep into the chemistry of this. Uh, you know, there was like, oh man, you need a degree just to uh, understand what's what's going on here. Jeff, did you catch any of that, or, or was that like phew, for you as well? Oh no, I I tried to keep my eyes open during the presentations and uh, kept, copies of, <laughs> kept copies of the slide decks for later. Right, exactly. I think, if I may interject, I think the important yes, part of the chemistry was uh, the discussion of cadmium. Yes. Um, that it's um, it's a known difficult uh, commodity to dispose of to deal with, and interestingly enough, that there are cadmium batteries uh, as well. So the. Our uh, quantum dot industry is seriously concerned about cadmium, yet uh, probably because there is a replacement, but maybe not an efficient replacement. But uh, interestingly enough, because the battery industry, cadmium is so important to it in that there are or maybe with lithium too, but um, there aren't really good replacements for it. So in the battery industry, they're just letting this go. In the QLED industry, they're really concerned about the chemistry. And uh, it, in a way, it doesn't make a lot of sense that we allow something to happen in uh, one technology and not another or you know we just dismiss it in the battery industry and mm. yet we're really concerned about it in the um, uh, QLED industry so I, th I, I at least had the impression that part of the discussion of the chemistry uh, was about having to dispose of these uh, uh, entities it, it, you know at some point when um, when it was time to get rid of them. Right, exactly. Uh, now, now there's only tiny bits of cadmium in a given TV, right? Because these quantum dots are so right. tiny, they're they're in the order of uh, two to five to ten nanometers in diameter. And yeah, there are millions and billions of them in there. 
Uh, but that, that's really not very much cadmium, especially compared to a battery. And, and yet in Europe, they've, they've obtained, uh, uh, what I want to say, uh, you know, they, they have gotten compensation, dispensation uh, is the word I was looking for, uh, with cadmium for, for quantum dots. Yet you're right, Joe, the, the industry is really concerned about cadmium and they're working very hard on developing cadmium free quantum dots. Uh, well, Scott, unfortunately, Scott, yeah, go ahead, Ron. It's the, the Rojas exception that the Europe got. And right. there are uh, cadmium free uh, quantums available, but now they're going into the hybrid, the mix of the cadmium based and cadmium free. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Rojas does have a specification for that, that they don't have to have the dispensation for that they do meet if they do the hybrid. Um, Mm, don't I know see. What that's the where the dispensation is. Okay. Right. Right. I got gotcha. you. All right. Um, but the so so the chemistry th that was the main thing that people were talking about at the summit was you know we got to be able to make cadmium free. The problem is cadmium based quantum dots have a very narrow spectrum. Basically, what we haven't said yet is a quantum dot takes in a blue photon, say a some blue light from an LED. And then re-emits a red or a green photon. Uh, Ron, I guess you did say that. And uh, we have a picture, actually, of QD spectrum that shows us sort of the difference between what happens with quantum dots and what happens with a typical backlight. You can see in this picture the sort of light blue line is the spectrum that you see more or less uh, in, in an LED backlit TV. Whereas with quantum dots, the blue spike is the blue LED. That doesn't change. But the green and the red spikes are very narrow, um, typically 25 to 30 nanometers uh, with cadmium. It's more like 40 to 50 nanometers with indium phosphate, so cadmium-free. Um, and this FWHM, by the way, is full width half maximum is how the bandwidth or the the width of this spectral emission is specified. Um, so we get very narrow red, green, and blue peaks instead of this broad thing here. And uh, Joe, I know you've got some things to say about why that may not necessarily be a good idea. Well, certainly it uh, comes to the way we see light. And uh, it turns out that all of us see light differently if we look at it on a nanometer by nanometer um, uh, spectrum. Uh, when light is covered with a very broad spectrum, um, everybody will agree on what they're seeing. When, when a, a color of light is covered by a narrow very narrow spectrum, we are aggravating the difference in the way each of us sees light. So from experience from my own display devices, when I have a broad spectrum of red, green, and blue, everybody agrees on what the light, you know, what the color looks like, and uh, it, it makes color correction easy as an example. But when you get very narrow red, green, and blue uh, as a source of light, there's often a discussion or disagreement on what uh, people are seeing. So it actually makes color correction uh, much more difficult. Uh, <laughs> among the things that were presented is that the consumers don't care. And <laughs> that the only people that are going to see this are colorists. Uh, <laughs> and um, I, I, I'm a little disappointed at that. Uh, at that position, but there are certainly a number of papers that were uh, written by people at RIT, as an example, that um, basically claim that narrow uh, bandwidths of red, green, and blue just won't work. And mm. I am in that camp. I would rather see a slightly broader spectrum of red, green, and blue. Mm. So maybe in that case, the uh, indium phosphide or cadmium free quantum dots, which have a broader spectrum of green and red, uh, might actually be better. They're not quite as efficient at converting blue light into red or green, uh, but uh, because they have a broader spectrum, you might see more consistency and agreement from one person to another about what color we're looking at. Right. 
Um, the, Jeff, the, did the, you certainly? Yeah, you know, go ahead. I, I was just going. to – Sorry, I, I expected Joe. I expected you to respond to that, and I apologize for not leading you into that. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what? What? Go ahead and finish your thought. With, there. with the delay, forgive me, but with the delay of the audio, sometimes, sometimes if uh, the conversation isn't directed towards one person, uh, by the time one person has jumped in, somebody else, something mm. else is already going on. Uh, Understood. Elsewhere. But uh, yeah, I. And I just I stand by the position I've been taking is from experience, at least within the post-production community and looking at my own projector that's used in quite a number of post-production houses that has a very broad spectrum for red, green and blue. Um, I've been told by a large number of colorists that it's a much easier to display to work with than the old CRTs, which had two narrow spikes for red and the the broad uh, coverage that I have for red in my um, my projector uh, has made life really easy for colorists. They've all told me that it's an infinitely better display than they ever had with the CRT. And we know it's the, the broad spectrum of the red that is helping them see a much more consistent picture than they're used to seeing. So it's okay. based on that that um, – I question the narrow spectrums. Mm -hmm. Now, Scott, we should that, say – sorry, go ahead, Ron. Uh, that, that's part of my objection to this big move to the LED lighting that we have in the home because it is so spiky. If uh, you put that in your closet and you're picking what you're going to wear – uh, by the time you get outside, you're going to look at it and go, oh, these reds don't match, and this doesn't mm -hmm. match, and that doesn't match. Because, supporting what Joe said, the, the spikier it is, is the less broad spectrum of light that your eye takes in, and you really don't see things properly. And I've objected to that, but, you know, the world's moving on to these LED lights because <laughs> of economics and business, et cetera, et cetera. But when it mm -hmm. comes down to the true light, it's so spiky that you're not getting a true representation. And when you do see what is white light, uh, your brain is filling in the gaps of those three three spikes. You know, and this your right. brain's filling a, that in. As opposed to sunlight, which is very broad spectrum. So as right. you say, you, you look at something under artificial lumina, illumination with these mm -hmm. spiky LED light bulbs, and then you walk outside, you know, you're going to see a different color. Uh, of right. the same thing. Yeah, I'm concerned with that, and the e-readers are the same. That white light on an e-reader is, you know, what's going to happen in how many years to the people's vision when your eyes just kind of give out after mm. seeing all that high, hard spikes. But the right. quantum dots, uh, yes, it's it's more color. You know, the spikes are bigger. Uh, but the spectrum isn't wider, and uh, I have to agree with what Joe's saying. You know, when you, you're doing critical color evaluation, it's better to have the broad spectrum. You know, mm -hmm. if you look at a power power curve uh, in comparison, which I've done in many times in projectors, uh, measure the digital projectors with the spikes, and then you put up a film projector with an open gate and just a white light on the screen, and you measure coming that. From a, coming from a xenon lamp. Right. And it's it's a just nice, big, broad, white, full spectrum, power spectrum, as opposed to seeing your, you know, three little spikes. Mm -hmm. Of course, your brain's well, filling that in. So it, you're fooling yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And one person fool is fooling themselves slightly differently than another person, as as Joe pointed right. out. To Joe's, uh, Joe's point. That's true. Yeah, exactly. Um uh, Jeff, let's talk a bit about uh, the different ways that you, one can use quantum dots in a display. And uh, the graphic I have here is QD form factors. Uh, there, there are several different ways that we that Ron mentioned a little earlier uh, that we can that we can do this. Uh, do you remember seeing this graphic? You must have. Um, yes, vaguely. Vaguely. So the way we do it now is with with a film, right? A, a basically, a film impregnated with quantum dots. Yeah, I think that's the the predominant way. And they were talking about using it, uh, you know, as as 
filters and as uh, you know, as, as active light generators as well. So it's right. Yeah, it was it was it was interesting that they, as you've already pointed out, you know, were were saying that all of these are QLEDs. The uh, functions and the behaviors are all radically different. <laughs> mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, as I as I said, the film is the one that we're using today primarily, which is blue LEDs. Hit a hit a film, a plastic film, which is embedded with red and green quantum dots. The the blue light causes them to glow red and green. Not all of the blue light is absorbed, and so that combines with the red and green, and you get white. And then you go through a color filter like you always have, and uh, and that's that's how it works. Um, edge optics is similar. It's a tube of quantum dots along the edge. But the next one, <coughs> pardon me. The next one that, that we talked quite a bit about on at the show was on chip, which is actually embedding quantum dots into the LED itself. Uh, and then you've got white light coming out of the LED. Up till now, we've, we've done that with phosphors. And uh, Joe, you know something about phosphors. <laughs> yes, just something. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you think about the idea of of using quantum dots in an LED instead of phosphors to create white light. Well, using all right. Um, uh, you get I'm, the same uh, problem right, here. I know. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm struggling to um, fit the analysis of, uh, or, or even where phosphors uh, fit into this, but. Um, <sighs> No, I, I'm I'm sorry. You trapped me in oh. uh, like connect. You you trapped me in wanting to connect this to phosphors, and I. Well, I'm, uh, I mean, phosphor. We've used phosphors for a long time. Yeah, I'm struggling to to to, to make a comparison here. Um, one of Joe, the things, maybe I can help you out. Go ahead. You know, the biggest thing here is we're we're dealing with a solid state device that is emitting light, where a phosphor has to be ignited for it to glow. And that's the biggest difference. You know, you, um, well, but the phosphor the phosphors in an LED, say you have a white LED which consists of a blue LED with phosphors in it. Right. Uh, and the the phosphors are hit by blue light and they glow, right? <laughs> Similar to quantum dots. Um, the phosphors are more mechanical. And mm. they, they are not as reliable because each one's going to ignite differently. So there ah. is a big delta difference between the way phosphors are going to ignite and emit, or I shouldn't say emit, they reflect, uh, versus a quantum dot that is ignited and it just glows. Plus the fact that phosphors are going to decay over a period right. of time. Mm. Uh, they're, uh, in theory, could end up changing color, in theory, I think. Often no, times. factually they will. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Factually they will. <laughs> yeah, I, and, uh, part of my. Mm, uh, uh, but <laughs> yes, so that um, there uh, and and that's actually what I should have been reaching for in the comparison of uh, using phosphors as opposed to uh, quantum dots. That quantum dots should produce a much more stable color of light and. In theory, over that the amount of light should be closer to the same over a much longer period of time. So, mm -hmm. in that in that sense, it should work um, better than phosphors. When when we were doing this, or when you had the diagram up, and you talked about full backlight versus uh, edge lit. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that has surprised me is that. Um, some companies going to quantum dots have left full LED backlit behind and gone to edge lit uh, QLED, which is, sort of surprised me in in the sense I, I guess I suppose it's less expensive, but um, uh, in what we're trying to accomplish and trying to get bit depth out of displays, I kind of think that full backlight is still going to be necessary if we want a high-end display. And in a way, I was almost disappointed that the full backlight seems to be going away in the particular examples that we were shown um, in this uh, 
presentation, this two day long presentation. Mm-hmm. And I granted there there are weak points of full backlight, like not enough individual areas. And I've recently seen some full backlight uh, sets where uh, the area of each uh, backlight was so large that when you had rolling credits, um, uh, it was like optical glare going on. There were very serious optical glare going on mm-hmm. because uh, as the credits would roll up the screen, uh, you would see white light behind all the credits. And, right. and so this, this white light was going up uh, along with them. So certainly full uh, backlight has a long way to go. Uh, you've got to be able to make the controllable area much, much smaller uh, than is currently going on. But it, at least for the moment, I'm disappointed in the fact that as we make this move to supposedly a better technology, we're doing it with edge lighting instead of uh, full backlight. And that mm-hmm. was something that I didn't think was adequately covered um, in the seminar. Hmm. Well, that's a good point. And I think what I want to make sure everybody understands what you're talking about in terms of a full backlight is a full array of LEDs behind the screen. So instead of having LEDs just along the edge, one edge or another, you have a full array across the entire backlight uh, of the, of the screen and full array FA Local dimming, LD, so the, all, the whole thing is called FALD, F-A-L-D. Uh, the local dimming means that certain zones of LEDs can brighten or darken independently and give you greater contrast and greater, uh, just, it, it's better a better support, picture. Better support local areas of the picture. And yes, exactly. In, in and if, way, those, if those zones are big, then you get this haloing that you've been talking about. Yes, uh, but, of course, if those zones are really small, and, of course, we've already talked about being able to modulate those zones. Uh, if they're small and we're able to modulate those zones, we can actually add a bit depth capability to the LCD display. We can augment the bit depth capability of the panel itself with the mm-hmm. backlight. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> now, one possibility that was, that was made, uh, that was talked about quite a bit at the summit was replacing the color filters in an LCD TV with quantum dots, with little pieces, little little sections filled with quantum dots. Um, and I have a graphic here, QDCF, or color filter, uh, one and two. Um, so actually, first of all, uh, go, go first to photo enhanced, QD photo enhanced. Uh, so this is the way we have it now. Basically, you've got an LCD, you've got a uh, blue LED passing through a film of quantum dots, labeled QDEF here, uh, passes through the LC layer, liquid crystal layer, and finally through color filters, a red, a green, and a blue. This is pretty inefficient because most of the light gets filtered out of each of them. Now, if we go to QDCF number one, we can see this is much more efficient the, the color is coming from what used to be the color filter. Uh, and the blue light from the LED is just passing straight through without, without being modified really at all. Uh, so we get much higher efficiency, much greater luminance, brightness uh, out of this. And uh, we think we should see the first examples of this at CES next year uh, and probably products by, by the end of the year or so on. And the other quick diagram I wanted to show people was uh, QDCF number two, uh, which basically adds a color filter on top of the quantum dot color filter. And the reason for that is uh, the ambient light from the room hitting, hitting the front of the TV could actually activate the quantum dots and cause them to glow. And that would look really weird. So uh, there is a, an, a one way to take care of that is to actually put co- color filters on top. But then the color filters have to be tuned very carefully to the same narrow band that the quantum dots are issuing. 
and uh, and let all that light come through. Uh, so that was just one thing I wanted to make sure everybody understood. And finally, the last the last uh, piece of this quantum dot puzzle is QD app three, which is called electroluminescent. And Ron, you mentioned this earlier, and I want to get back to it uh, just a little bit here, because the, in this case you have you know it's like an OLED, and you apply an electric current and little pieces of quantum dots glow green, red, or blue, and it works just like an OLED TV. And that's when I think the term QLED becomes relevant and significant. Right, right, exactly. Scott, if uh, you would go back to the diagram that, um, that you just had where you were showing uh, the three pieces of light coming out, and you were showing that the blue light is coming out directly, and you were sure, showing that the red and green light were coming out uh, not directly, but at all sorts of angles. I believe yes, it was that's Gary QD, Merson. QD CF number one. Yeah, I believe it was Gary Merson that uh, got up and said, well, isn't this going to affect off-axis viewing? Mm, um, good point. And, and I think that I think his point needs to be remade here in that with LCD sets, we already have off axis um, viewing issues. And this approach could be aggravating those off axis viewing angles. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point. Um, another point that, that was made during the during the presentation was the quantum dots actually emit light in all directions. And so some of it actually goes back down into that sandwich structure. And so they're talking about reflectors and light, light uh, redirectors to make sure that all the light ends up going out uh, instead of some of it coming back in. So I thought that was pretty good. Um, <clears throat> Barfel is asking, how do the QDs how are the QDs addressed? If the dots are used to both provide color and modulate the light coming from the screen, they have to be addressed somehow. That's right. They have to be modulated. <clears throat> they're, they're putting out the right color, but how do you make them dimmer or lighter? That's the job of the LCD layer, the LC layer that was there. The actual LCD um, subpixels, those are what brighten or dim and allow more light to get through from the backlight. And that is how it's done. Um, so we need to move on here. I, I wanted to touch upon, we, we mentioned, we mentioned uh, putting quantum dots in LEDs. And there was actually an interesting presentation about micro LED displays where you have tiny, tiny, tiny little LEDs that are, in fact, directly emitting and producing, producing the picture. The picture. It. Yes, mm -hmm. without an LCD layer to modulate the light level, as Barfel asked about. And exa examples of that include the Sony Cletus, which we saw at CES last year, and the Samsung Cinema Screen, which, Joe, you and I talked about. You saw it at CinemaCon. And yes. we heard we heard about it as well at at this at this event. Um, each each group each pixel is a tiny group of R RGB micro LEDs, which are only microns in size. And we have a, a photo micrograph of called micro LEDs. Those things are only ten microns across, or the pitch is ten microns, so they're center to center, ten microns across. One of the problems there is. Phosphor particles are larger than that, so they have to use quantum dots because there's no other way to to uh, to make the the LEDs glow in the right color. Um, there's also a photomicrograph of a micro LED RGB array that we, I wanted to show you. And this is just again, these are super tiny, and I think the future, uh, one of the futures possibly of displays. Um, Electroluminescent quantum dots is one, and RGB micro LED arrays is another. So, and these are these are still in the research and development stage. Um, Jeff, have you ever seen? You saw the Cletus, I'm sure, at, C at CES, right? Yeah, I did see that. I have not yet seen the uh, the Samsung. 
Mm, I haven't either. I think uh, Ron, have you seen the Samsung? Uh, yes, I have. I know yeah. Joe really liked it. What was your impression? It's it's amazing. It's remarkable, actually. Uh, I think uh, that is definitely way the future of cinema exhibition is, is mm -hmm. going into that screen because it's emissive. Uh, but anyone who knows exhibition knows that that's going to create problems because now we do have backlash light from the projector hits the screen and then throws a backlash light back towards the projector. Uh, with this, you're just, it's, and they cautioned us not to say this, but it's, Joe, you have to agree, it's the only way you can really describe it. It, it is like a great big TV because it's emissive light. Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's, it's it's glowing right in your face, and it's pretty bright. So anything in that theater, that light's going to bounce off of, including the people. Mm. So it's going to be interesting. We uh, when we were doing the uh, uh, the Simpty DC twenty eight cinema standards, uh, we had a theater uh, that we did testing with down on Hollywood Boulevard, and we would try to balance projector. And the image versus the technical setup was very different. And we were having a hard time with it until one of our colleagues, uh, uh, Richard Stumpf, great man, mm. uh, figured out that the red velvet seats in the theater, the <laughs> red backlash was bouncing back up on the screen. Of course, it's not and a factor when your theater's filled with people, but we had to go cover all of the seats. Oh so, man! So this this technology is going back into that arena where the 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 light, I, Joe, the light coming from the Samsung screen is pretty overwhelming. I don't think the backlash well, would be that great. Would no, you? well, and the backlash is going to be even less because um, you can literally shine a light on that screen and it will absorb the majority of light. If you go back. <laughs> look at the diagram, if you look at the pictures of the LEDs, you're going to find that the majority of them are surrounded by black. And mm. so what's what's happening is the area, uh, the area that is not emitting light is actually absorbing light. So, right. uh, and the demonstration that I saw with Samsung, they literally put a light on the display. And um, it, it, it effectively didn't change the quality of the picture the that that panel is basically a light absorber when it comes to anything hitting it externally mm -hmm. so i looked at this and said gee this is a really good thing uh, <laughs> yeah try the, try shining a flashlight on a projector screen <laughs> well uh, especially especially when they're talking about 500 nits um as at least a beginning of a light output. They're they're talking about um, hours to 250 nits. In other words, it is going to uh, decay in light output, but um, they're going to start out at 500 nits. And um, it, it, and, and by the way, by the way, before you before you go on, let me just by way of comparison, typical uh, cinema projector uh, reaches about 48 nits. Dolby yeah, Vision so ten times. Yeah, Dolby Vision reaches a hundred nits, so yeah. this is five times brighter than that. Right. Yes, a, conven a conventional screen is uh, two thousand five hundred to one contrast ratio, and mm -hmm. the Samsung is infinity to one. <laughs> That's their statistic. So it's like because it goes because it goes to full black. Goes to exactly. really well, and, and part that. of the reason they're be able to claim that is that even when there's ambient light, uh, the the black out of the display is still black. Right. right. So that <laughs> even in the face of um, exit lights, uh, the uh, you know the row lights and uh, reflections off the seat, uh, you're still going to maintain a higher contrast ratio than you are off a projection screen. Mm -hmm. The other mm -hmm. the other advantage with this is going into high dynamic range. The HDR with this mm -hmm. technology is yep. incredible. So, you know, HDR is not something that it does. It's just a byproduct of what the technology is. So these uh, elements with everything we just described uh, are very, very good. The color rendition is better. 
the contrast ratio and um the HDR is just there. So it it's killing three birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. Mike Heiss in the chat room is, is reminding us, and something I wanted to make sure we uh, just touched upon, is that with the Cletus or the Samsung Cinema Screen or any of these micro LED displays, they are not acoustically transparent. So you can't put speakers behind them as they are in virtually all commercial cinemas today. You have to put the speakers above or below. And Samsung talked a little bit about this, saying that they have a technology that sort of uses DSP to, to make it seem like the sound is coming from the screen itself. But that's kind of an important consideration, don't you think? Well, considering that they, that they bought Harman, and Harman yeah. is a premier audio company, yeah. uh, I, I don't. Th to me, it's not that big of a deal because in home theater, we've been doing phantom center for how long? Almost forever. You know, I don't have a center speaker. I use a phantom center. Ah, there you go. And so what they're doing is they're putting speakers above and below the screen and doing the phantom to the center of the screen. Mm. So, you know, it's not magic, and it works. Mm -hmm. you know, I, certainly, so I putting, know. certainly putting a speaker above and below would allow you to, to make a phantom image right in the middle of the screen and that that would work very well and then you throw um, atmos on there and <laughs> the rest of the theater is all audio anyway so i don't think that's it's it's a point to note but i don't think it's going to be any challenge i don't think anybody's ever going to notice it mm -hmm. dig max in the chat room is is asking wouldn't being that bright cause eye fatigue uh that well, they're, is not gonna, point they're not going to run it that hot well, well, not necessarily, Joe. Go ahead. E even if they do, um, uh, I'm uh, one of the questions I asked during the seminar is: with that kind of contrast ratio and that kind of light output, don't you think that uh, ambient light behind the screen is going to be absolutely necessary? Mm. Uh, I, we have long been advocating, even um, at 30 foot Lamberts or 100 nits, that is it is absolutely necessary to have. Uh, light behind the set so that that you have a bias uh, a bias light to um, keep the fatigue factor down um, I backlight my home theater screen here because when I have a new lamp in I'm getting 23 to 26 foot Lamberts and that is way too bright for me to watch without some sort of ambient light around the screen and I've done tests here uh, for members of the DCI and digital cinema initiatives. And mm -hmm. among the things that they've noticed, uh, which actually pleased me, they said, you know, when the bias light is on, the contrast off the screen looks a lot better. <laughs> Meaning that by, by closing your irises down just a little bit, suddenly the blacks actually look better than they did, uh, you know, in a totally dark room. And I was surprised when they just commented, oh, we like the picture a lot better with the bias light on, that we're, we're actually seeing more contrast from the picture. Uh, there's that, but I also uh, talked about the 100 nits of the Dolby uh, H, uh, you know, the high dynamic range cinema. Mm -hmm. And several people that have attended my meetings uh, here have said, well, you know, they got through the 100 nit movie just fine and didn't notice any fatigue. So what I did in my place is I started them off watching a movie with the light on. And then I shut it off and I just waited. And about <laughs> 15 minutes later, it was, can you please turn that light back on? Because they didn't understand the fatigue until there was a differential between no fatigue and fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't understand the fatigue that was set in uh, as part of the um, 100 nit Dolby level. And I was, uh, I was running maybe 75 nits, not 100 nits. And uh, they didn't understand the fatigue until they felt the difference. Mm -hmm. and, and then they got it. And then it's like, oh, yeah. So in in my world, I don't really care what light output that they run as long as there's a sufficient uh, ambient 
to work with it, they can run a thousand nits. I don't really care. And, <laughs> uh, as long as the bias light allows as as bias, your, yeah. That's right. As long right, as the bias right. light's there, I don't really care. Mm. Scott, um, yeah. the other big benefit to this um, technology is two things. One, you have perfect white field uniformity on mm. the screen. Yep. And there's no geometric distortion. Right. Because you're not because if dealing you're, with you're projecting a from Yeah, if you, you project from a single point, basically, the projector lens, and it fans out, the light fans out, right. there's going to be geometric distortion, and there's going to be uniformity issues, which are people right. work very hard to, to solve, but they go away with these yeah. micro LED displays. So, so, so the picture is sharper, clearer, the color rendition is better, and with the white field uniformity, uh, you're seeing a better overall picture with the color imagery, obviously, now with the, the white field uniformity. But mm -hmm. with a, a screen, you know, the projector may not be uh, in perfect alignment or the screen moves. Uh, in a theater, they, you know, do masking, but some theaters actually move the screen. So there's an issue there of the screen introducing the geometric distortion. So mm -hmm. this technology eliminates all of those things. Yeah, yeah. I was heartened to hear that uh, I believe the first Samsung cinema screen in a commercial cinema is being installed soon, if not already, in Korea. Uh, there will also be a demonstration screen here in L.A. It's not going to be open to the public as far as I know, uh, no. but uh, I, I'm looking forward to going and seeing that because I haven't seen it myself. Uh, so I... I'm looking forward to Samsung <laughs> inviting me to come see that thing because it's 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 really pretty great. Listen, before we run out of time, uh, I want to get to HDR10 and HDR10 Plus, which was the other part of this summit and uh, quite an important part, I think. Um, certainly, one of the big big points that was being discussed by Samsung, particularly who in, sort of developed this was what's called HDR10+. Plus. Now, HDR10, which is the high dynamic range format used on Ultra HD Blu-ray, almost exclusively, a couple of examples, a couple of counterexamples now, but primarily that's what it is, uh, and also a lot of streaming and so on. Uh, yeah, this is going to get pretty geeky here, uh, but that uh, we're all geeks on this bus. They... They use what's called metadata because they have to be able to tell the display what was the brightest thing in this in this movie and what was the sort of Mac average of this movie. But they only have one piece of information for each of those for the entire movie or TV show or whatever. What Samsung is and, and that causes some problems. And in fact, I wanted to show what the problems were. Um, those being uh, HDR10 tone mapping. Let's start with that. Uh, and I'm I'm moving pretty fast here, and we can see that if the peak of the display is 500 nits, but the maximum brightness of the mastering was a thousand, then the TV's got to roll it off. If the maximum brightness of the of the mastering was 2,000 nits. It's got to roll it off faster, more. Uh, and so the picture generally ends up being dimmer. Uh, if we go to uh, S uh, HDR10 STM1, we can see what happens with static tone mapping, uh, where you can design this tone mapping curve, which tells the TV what to do with stuff that's brighter than it can do. Um, you can set it up so that you can you can preserve the dark stuff and the midtone stuff, but the bright stuff gets oversaturated. Or you can do it the other way with HDR STM2, and you can preserve the the bright parts and the midtones, but then the the dim scenes look too dim. Uh, their answer is what's called dynamic metadata and dynamic tone mapping, which is HDR10 DTM. And that lets you use different tone mapping curves for dark scenes, mid-tones, and bright scenes. Um, and 
in other words, preserves everything, no matter what your TV is capable of doing versus what the mastering display was capable of doing. And that's one of the real challenges of HDR, of high dynamic range, is, uh, Joe, you talked about this in your presentation. You know, in, in SDR, when we were in the past with CRTs and, and standard dynamic range, everything worked the same. Mastering monitors, presumably, mastering monitors, consumer displays, the content all was supposed to match. Now, with HDR, you've got so many different capabilities, TVs that can reach a few hundred nits, TVs that can reach a thousand nits, TVs that can reach almost 2,000 nits, as, as in the Samsung Q series, uh, versus what, what do they do on the mastering display? Though Those are different, too, 1,000 to 4,000 nits. So how do you deal with the fact that now the capabilities are different from, from one TV to the next, from one mastering monitor to the next, from one comp piece of content to the next. Uh, Joe, you, you dealt with this pretty well in, in, the, uh, in your particular address there. Well, uh, I, I dealt with it in, uh, in one way. Uh, a comment that I want to make just based on what you're saying is uh, mm. we just do away with PQ. Uh, I, 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 I recognize that it's supposed to be much more efficient uh, at a uh, oh, man. Uh, at, uh, it's, it's much more efficient in the way it handles uh, the bit depth that's available to the uh, signal but the description of what you just gave us was we have a fixed we have a fixed curve for producing a program and we're trying to play it back on a variable system. So we're, we're actually trying to, we're actually trying to figure out how to make fixed variable. Mm. And this, this actually has nothing to do with the presentation I did, but mm. I want to just to take forward what you're discussing directly and okay. say, one of the things that bothers me about uh, PQ is that we can't do it. That uh, OLED can't do it. Uh, it. PQ is supposed to be uh, all the way out to 10,000 nits. Well, there's nothing that does 10,000 nits, but there's some stuff that's mastered at 4,000 nits. And why is it being mastered at 4,000 nits when there aren't displays out there that go above 2,000 nits? I'm going to say 2,000 because that's probably mm -hmm. the upper limit of consumers. So why mm -hmm. are we even mastering on an absolute curve when there is absolutely nothing out there that can reproduce it? By the way, uh, just, to make sure, just to make sure that everybody understands, PQ that you're referring to uh, stands for perceptual quantizer. It's basically a curve developed by Dolby, now standardized by Simpty, that tells the TV if you get if you get a pixel that's supposed to be a certain brightness, uh, you know, play it at that at that brightness. So the curve is slightly different than what we've used up till now, called gamma. Uh, and, and it's, it's, as Joe says, absolute. That means every point along the curve represents a specific brightness in nits or candelas per meter squared to use the more correct term. Uh, whereas gamma is what's called relative. So it goes from zero to one. So whatever the yes. TV can do, it follows it. Uh, whereas PQ is absolute. And this is what we use mostly for HDR these days. And Joe, you're advocating something pretty radical which is you think we shouldn't be using it? Well, I, I, I basically it doesn't work because it's put together. Um, and among the things that would tie into the presentation that I did is that um, we need to have more variability. Now, I'm normally not an advocate of variability. I want everything fixed. I want to know exactly what I'm doing. But yeah. that's that's never going to happen in this world. And, uh, mm -hmm. We've opened up Pandora's box with uh, HDR, with UHD, with uh, wider color gamut, with higher frame rates. Uh, standardization is off the table for what we're doing. And so... I actually firmly believe that we have to build a system that will accommodate all of this variability. And that was the presentation that I had done um, uh, during the seminar. I basically wanted to throw back to a point in time when DCI was variable. In other words, 
projectors were already going into theaters before standards had been set. So projectors had to be built so that down the road, when we actually did figure out what we were doing, whatever projector was already there, it could be tuned to whatever uh, came about in the new system. And that technology has been employed in consumer products. The projector I have on the market, uh, when the first one, 720p version, came out in 2003, it had the technology to measure itself. Well, it, you measured it and told the projector what it was. And then you told it what you wanted it to do, and it would calculate the difference. And mm -hmm. What you want it to do can come in the form of metadata. So if I suddenly want to do my program at D60, another color of gray, as, as opposed to D65, I just tell the projector to go to D60. Or mm -hmm. if I want it to do Adobe RGB in, instead of P3, I just tell it, set itself up for Adobe RGB. Now, the capability was developed and... Um, uh, really put together well for the DCI. And so the technology already exists to do this. And, uh, and by the way, that's had, that's Digital Cinema Initiative. That's for digital cinema. And Joe, you were talking about putting projectors into commercial cinemas, digital projectors, uh, before the DCI had finalized its specs. And so the, those projectors had to adapt. That's correct. And Well, there, so, was, there was just a f precious few of those from Technicolor that went in at that time. So, you know, I agree with what Joe's saying, but that was just a short period of time. But um, the technology to calibrate the projectors all still exists. That, right. that method of measuring what the projector can do on its own and then calculating the difference to where it needs to be still exists in every, um, at least every DLP projector today. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, other, the other curve in there we should talk about, Scott, is the hyperlog gamma. HLG, mm. which is the alternative to PQ. And most of all of the acquisition cameras, you choose whether you want to do HLG or PQ. And the HLG curve is a lot more flexible of what Joe is saying, where the PQ is hard fixed. Well, the HLG is flexible. Mm. Uh, and you can program it to be whatever you want it to be, which is the opposite of what PQ is, and I think what Joe is advocating. So there is an avenue for that. And most of the broadcasters doing the uh, HDR are opting for HLG rather than PQ. Now, PQ Which I think, is, I, think, I think HLG was designed more for broadcasting than for correct. Uh, packaged correct. content, like pre-done, pre post-produced podcast, I mean... Uh, you know, uh, television shows, movies on disc, that sort of thing. Well, no, HLG is any is capable of anything. Any of those. It is cameras. sure, sure, of course. But its primary well, uh, application up till now, I think, according to the BBC, anyway, who who co-developed it with NHK, is right. it has been for broadcast, right? Right. Yeah, a video. We'll just use the term mm -hmm. video, although digital acquisition for future films is theoretically video. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it, it is in fact for anything is 3840 by 2160. That's the avenue that they went with uh, BBC and and NHK. Mm -hmm. Of course, until BBC just decided that they didn't like the curve and now they want to change it. Oh really? <laughs> when did that happen? Yeah. <clears throat> about a month ago. Oh man. Yeah, NHK so is not really happy about that. <laughs> We're still in the Wild West here in, yeah, in yeah, HDR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there isn't that many things out there right now that are hard-coded to do that. I mean, all of the cameras, whether they're cinema cameras or broadcast cameras, it's a choice. And you tweak it, and life is good. Uh, and I think, uh, Jeff, are the set manufacturers, are they putting both decoders in the TVs? I'm not sure. Um. S some of them, I mean, I know uh, LG, you know, is is from 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 the standpoint of the HDR, uh, is is trying to accommodate almost every HDR spec that's out there. The and and they showed that at CES. Um, mm -hmm. HDR10 Plus is not on their roadmap, but 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 all the other flavors. Yeah, right. Um, Jeff, I wanted to get you in here uh, 
you spent some time looking at Florian Friedrich's uh, proposed test methodology. He had, he had some interesting ideas, didn't he? Um, yeah, I mean, we saw a number of different, you know, interesting demonstrations there of, uh, you know, looking at the uh, um, impact of, you know, comparative value, I guess, of the HDR10 plus uh, and, and the HDR10. You know, you and I both uh, also saw the, the comparison that Colorfront was putting on there of, mm -hmm. you know, split screen showing the uh, HDR10 and, and 10 plus, kind of going back to what you were saying earlier, you know, what's the difference, the scene uh, adjustment and correction. Right. Um, yeah, and, and Florian was showing some interesting things, although you know, one of the uh, things I noticed uh, in looking at his demo, um, it, it was possible to highlight the uh, distinction between um, uh, the two elements he was showing. He was showing a, an OLED set uh, on, on, on the bottom, I think, on the in bottom, his demo, yeah. and, and, and a quantum dot uh, set on the top and showing that, you know, there was a... Um, a capability of showing the picture more stably uh, in the right. in the quantum dot. You know, he, he put a light meter in front of a of a particular test pattern um, and showed that the that the screen brightness was fluctuating a, a fair amount as as motion content was playing on the OLED and it fluctuated much less on the uh, on the upper display. But it was interesting that in order to really get the the impact of that in in terms of the quality of the the upper and lower picture, um, you really needed to be staying, you know, standing right in front of the two TV sets so that their center line was the same. If, if you moved far enough to the right or left, um, you saw a bigger difference between the top and the bottom uh, as a result of the relatively narrow view uh, of the LED set as compared mm -hmm. to the OLED. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a kind I think of the, the variability that, that, that Florian was showing and demonstrating, it was fascinating to see it. Um, but uh, it, it washed out a little bit uh, if you got off When you axis. went off axis, yeah. His yeah. point, I think, was very well taken, which was getting back again to this variability of, yeah. of, of capability between different sets. Uh, if we look at the graphic called FFL versus window size, luminance versus window size, uh, we will see... Uh, two TVs that he measured, and as the window size, as the size of the white window it increases, um, one of the displays uh, decreases its brightness tremendously, and that had to be an OLED, uh, versus that would be display B, whereas display A maintains much more of its luminance capability. So, Right there is an example of extreme variability between two different TVs. And so what he proposes in order to evaluate that is placing a small test pattern in the center of actual content. And so the picture that uh, we showed a moment ago called the uh, FF demo uh, shows that. It shows this, and he put this together, a little a little patch stuck on the, stuck just overlaid onto motion content. And you can see in the center of this, the center major part of this little patch, in this case is a thousand nits. And then he's got a little step pattern above uh, going, uh, I think five hundred, six, seven, eight, nine, and a thousand. Um, and you can see when you're looking at a, an image with low overall light, say a night scene he's got something with a very it's very dark generally then the difference the ambient light uh is very similar between the two or not the ambient light i mean the uh, luminance and then when you play a bright scene like this one the difference is very great more so on the oled below than on the uh qled <laughs> q9 above and so this is an indicator uh that florian proposed of HDR stability. You know, how stable does it stay depending upon what is it's showing? And so I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, and I just wanted to make sure that we touched upon that. Um, yeah, it, it, one of the things that I find interesting in, in that demo, not that it was aimed at doing that, but if you took the two displays, and I noticed that the, the demo was 
uh, a little bit less aggressively um, different on day two um, because huh, I think they, they – well, I think they calibrated the displays. I think they were not mm. calibrated precisely the same the first day and so – not with any – intent but just happened to be the way it was uh, mm -hmm. so some of the things he was not directly pointing out that people were observing uh, were were more contrasty but what i found is even when everything was set perfectly um the two images rarely looked the same the motion images even when you took the test pattern off you, mm. know, you were using uh and and you and i saw that as well on the uh the color front demo when they were showing the HDR 10 and 10 plus the the split screens at different knit levels, uh, mm -hmm. you know, looked very different, uh, and that's what I find a, a very interesting challenge uh, that's coming with the HDR: the different sets, the different technologies in the sets, the different mastering protocols. Uh, people in Hollywood making movies and making them for home distribution spend a bizarre amount of time. <laughs> making sure that an image is exactly the way they want to see it, this creative intent, the director's intent. Right. Um, and, and they make stuff for the home differently. At, you know, they make it usually after the theatrical film has been beaten into appropriate shape. Uh, they then re-manipulate it because everyone understands that the home viewing environment is radically different from a cinema uh, in, in many, many ways, even back mm. when it was tube television um, mm. all of this effort made to make this the picture look exactly right and every time i go into these environments where you're a being off the same content and the picture looks different on each set i am inclined to ask the person who's most familiar with the content which one of these is the one you intended for the living room because they're different they, they may be equally interesting they may not be bad images but one of them is not the one that everybody worked so hard to make for the Very home. good point. Very and good the point. And odds, the odds today of a high dynamic range image getting into the home and looking anything like what it looked like in the, in the mastering room or the, or the production and coding room seems to be declining with each step in, 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 in new mm. addition in the, in the technology. It's making a, a very interesting approach to how do you in create a master hopefully one, not five or six different ones, but then deliver that master into all of these different kinds of TV sets and have each one, and, and here you start to get now into con uh, considerations of metadata in a sense of what is the creative intent? How do I tell the TV what the creative intent was in this master? And then how does the TV act on that data to get as close as that TV can? I'm mm -hmm. an OLED. I, I can't get any brighter than this no matter what I do, but if, if I adjust my curve uh, to, to take the brightest I can make and make the contrast to the blackest that I can get um, look like what the creative intent was, the, the, the degree of contrast across the gradient, it won't look just like a QLED screen, but most people don't watch a movie in an A-B comparison, one or another TV <laughs> set and if if what they get is the best that that TV can render from that original creative intent, then maybe the effort shouldn't be so much on matching the displays and matching the colors from one to the other, but rather finding a way to take that single creatively adjusted master and delivering it along with descriptive metadata that lets the TV set extract um, and, and reproduce as best it can. Mm -hmm. Joey, that was one of the primary points of your presentation was the single master approach, right? Yes. Yes. Um, in, in, in that particular case, and we, um, we actually had demonstrations going on here yesterday um, all about that. Um, the, the idea uh, is all this variability that we're talking about with a single master and at least being able to communicate with the set. Um, if we know that the set has a specific capability uh, and or, as an example, we can download an EOTF, an electrical to optical transfer function, uh, the equivalent of gamma or PQ or uh, HLG. HLG, yeah. Uh, 
Yes. If, if we could actually load that into the display from the source, um, we could actually do things to get the display to be very close to where it is supposed to be to accurately reproduce uh, an image. And yes, there, there's going to be changes, uh, a matrix transformation uh, to get to exactly what the set can do from where uh, the master was supposed to be. But I'm looking at this situation as an extension of some of the things that already exist. As an example, if you tune into any of the over over the top channels, whether it's Netflix or Hulu or Amazon, um, there's a query of your system about the data rate that you can handle. And so, mm -hmm. if you can only handle a 720p picture, 720p is what's sent. Well, right. I want to take that one step further and have the display tell the source what it's capable of doing and actually have the source configure itself to something that's relatively close to the display and or send instructions to the display saying, make yourself uh, D60 instead of D65. Make yourself Adobe RGB. Uh, make yourself this EOTF instead of that EOTF. And mm -hmm. so what I was advocating is that we are already communicating from the display to the source in, in at least over the top uh, technology and why not uh, communicate in a much bigger way? Why not tell the source what um, what the display is capable of doing? And instead of just sending down 720p or 1080p or something like that, just send uh, the colorimetry, send the EOTF, send the grayscale information that the set might set itself up for. And I actually believe that. If the source were to send instructions to the TV to set itself up for D60 as an example or whatever, it would probably do a better job of getting there than any consumer would do manually anyway. Mm. And so I actually believe that by doing this, we could remove a lot of the variability uh, that we're currently seeing in today's sets. But Joe, with that thought, don't you think that that's going to cause, oh, God, chaos is a better word. If you want the TV to talk to the source, I'm assuming it's the set-top box or a device there, so that what's coming from Netflix is they're not going to fluctuate what's coming from Netflix, but what the box would do is a different thing. But I'm thinking, from what I'm hearing you say, uh, that two-way street, would be nice, but I think it's totally impractical. I mean, uh, to have the set adapt to what the box is doing, I think is a far more uh, more economical way of handling the data than trying to do it two-way back and forth. I mean, you're talking a lot of electronics uh, in addition to the information that's already there, like this is who I am, this is what I need. That's kind of like the uh, EDID concept, well, right? And and it and and the answer to that is it call it all comes down to redefining what UHD is. Uh, among the things that I have been advocating for a long time is that uh, UHD needs to be redefined as the communication link between the source and the destination, and it actually has nothing to do with what's at the destination or what's at the source. It has everything to do with being able to communicate uh, between the two. I agree that there are difficulties in doing that uh, now. Uh, one of the solutions that is potentially on the table in discussions uh, that we had yesterday as an example is that um, the master, the single master, uh, come down the pike and so that the, all the capability of the single master would be at the input to the display or the input to the set-top box or whatever was uh, right, controlling right. the display. And so that's the first solution to – I agree with you, Ron, that the, the communication problems uh, could potentially be horrendous. But 
I can initially solve that by bringing the single master as close to the display as I possibly can so that the path of communication is short and controllable. Agreed. 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 That's Mm. true. Now, with that said, Scott, thanks, Joe. That's an introduction. They did uh, spend quite a bit of time on ATSC 3.0, which is a two-way communication. Mm, True enough. This is the broadcast standard. We've talked about it on the show as well in in times past. Uh, The new over-the-air broadcast standard that's going to, sooner than later, I'd say, replace ATSC 1.0, which is what we currently have. Right. Uh, And and that is a two-way street, so to speak. Uh, There's data traveling in both directions. Uh, So that may be one place where Joe's idea could be implemented uh, as long as we have enough bandwidth uh, to carry all that information. I was just thinking, sitting here thinking that another thing that might be required uh, to implement Joe's idea is uh, HDMI 2.1 at a higher bandwidth, uh, which it currently, it, it is specified to be able to support up to 48 megabits per second, which is three times the current maximum bandwidth. And that might be necessary in order to do this. Joe, don't you think? Yes. And uh, I'm going to harken back to my statements about uh, HDMI. Um, d- uh, DisplayPort is still ahead of HDMI. Mm, good point. And, and a given. I, a given. <laughs> um, I... One of the things I hate about HDMI is it seems to be always repairing problems that are already here. It is never looking forward to what might come. And Well, doesn't oh, HDMI 2.1 do that, though? I don't think anywhere near enough. Ah, uh, not not right. from what... Because I can already present problems uh, that are going to come up that HDMI 2.1 can't handle. And... Uh, I mean, we aren't even there yet, and I can already tell you where it's going to go out of, out of date. <laughs> <laughs> He's, you're and, right, Joe. You're, you're right. You're right. Well, and when, yeah, when HDMI 2.0 true. got here, it, 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 it didn't solve all the problems that were already known before it arrived. Right. It, yes. it, it solved some of the biggest ones or, or most conspicuous ones. but mm-hmm. And that's my point. It's always looking backwards. Mm. It's well, always it, looking it, at yesterday. To clarify, and I agree wholeheartedly, Joe and I have been in agreement with this a long time, that DisplayPort is the, the way to go because DisplayPort is nothing but a great big pipe. Mm. you know, And you put in it what you want, and you tell it what you want it to do on either end, and it's the chipset on either end that really do it. As HDMI, you have all of these parameters and these restrictions and, and spaces and code values and things. But you go to DisplayPort, it's just open and it's big and you can do anything you want in it. Well, <laughs> I think the problem, and everyone would agree, uh, DisplayPort suffers from the same problem that Linux does. Ah. Nobody owns it. <clears throat> so right. nobody's pushing it. Yeah. And, it's and nobody so, makes so, money. So everybody, everybody in the listening audience is going, oh, oh great, you know, I, I, I'll go for the, uh, uh, the DisplayPort thing. You, you don't own a device that has it and you're not going to get one because they're not in the stores. Um, you know, except your computer display. So if you want to start right. watching. Right. And, and, uh, and I think Panasonic implemented DisplayPort on one or two of its TVs in the past. Um, I, I but think they're not selling those in the U.S., though. But, that, but No, they're not. They're not selling any TVs in the U.S. at this point. Yep. Um, you know, the other, the other problem I see with that is HDMI is already so entrenched that oh, for, yeah. DisplayPort, for DisplayPort to sort of come along and supplant it, it's got to overcome just simply the installed base hurdle. It's already been out for so long. I think, I think Scott, the point I'm trying to make is the people who are uh, trying to push HDMI forward are not looking at what else is out there. Uh, it, mm. HDMI doesn't have to be DisplayPort, but HDMI could learn from DisplayPort. Mm. Uh, oh, okay. uh, what I'm saying is the example, and I'm using DisplayPort as the example, it's out there. It works. It would do everything we need to do. And the fact that HDMI has an example in front of it and doesn't understand that they need to be looking at that and implementing it and and making some equally workable system available, uh, I'm confused. I don't don't, 
Mm. As I said, uh, the best I can say is they're always looking behind them. They're never looking forward. Now, you know, THX1138 in the chat room is saying one of the key reasons HDMI trumps display port for AV uh, <clears throat> is that HDMI will work up to lengths of 10 meters, but display port is limited to two or three meters. Is that true in terms of cable length? Um, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah, I, Holly, I, I, where's I, where's I, Steve Lampin when you need him? <laughs> <laughs> no, I I don't, I don't know, but that to true, me does it, not ring true. I think somebody would no. have screamed that a long time ago. And, no. Actually, well, with, but, with DisplayPort, you can put them in the uh, well. You basically they're uh, USB boxes and use them as repeaters. I've done you that can use before. Them as repeaters. Like this. Yeah. I mean, I can understand how DisplayPort might be length limited, cable length limited, because if it's primarily for computer displays, then you're not going to be more than two meters from your computer. Um, so it, the, that length is not an important, not an important consideration there. But for AV equipment. It certainly can be. Uh, so that's worthy of some some additional study. Right. Um, before we go, and it's way past time to go, um, Mike Heiss is re reminding us that ATSC 3.0 won't really replace 1.0. For many years, they will coexist. So I, I misspoke earlier. I think that that's probably true. Um, well, and I then think one last point. What one point there, Scott, is that the uh, ATSC 1.0 was mandatory. 3.0 hmm. is not. It's voluntary. Ah, well, that's one reason why they'll coexist then for a long time. Exactly. A lot of stations right. aren't going to want to upgrade their equipment yet again. Uh, and it's very Or they're expensive. going to have to maintain ATSC 1 as they're doing ATSC 3. That's yes. what oh, I'm yeah. worried about. They're going to have to <laughs> oh, maintain yeah. ATSC 1 as they do ATSC 3. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. That's mm -hmm. oh so true. That's so true. And it's so, changing the tower elements, not the tower, but the elements, putting in right. a new exciter in the transmitter or putting mm -hmm. in a, uh, a parallel uh, feed to the to the tower. That's expensive. And these days, television stations aren't making a whole heck of a lot of money. You know, mm -hmm. so they don't have money to throw around. Yeah. So I, yeah. think, I think at the conference, they did not make a big deal out of ATSC 3.0 being voluntary. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, one last <clears throat> one last question from iPad thirty forty uh, thirty four fifty nine. Uh, Joe, what's the status of your uh, latest uh, test patterns and and so on? You're, I know I'm pretty sure you're working on UHD high dynamic range yes. kind of test patterns. What's what's going on with that? My distributor has set a deadline that it has to be on the market by the beginning of the fourth quarter. And <laughs> I think that's the only way it's going to get done. <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly uh, deadlines do have a way of motivating you. I know this all too well. Uh, <clears throat> well, listen, we've come to well past the end of a fascinating hour. I want to thank you all for being here. And uh, there's so much more we could talk about. I mean, you know, we had one hour and plus to, to talk about what happened over two days. So uh, I think we covered a lot of ground here, and I want to thank you all so much for being here. Uh, Joe Kane, uh, you can find out much more about his work at videoessentials.com. Joe, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Um, Ron Williams, his website is landmarkcolor.com. Ron, always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much, Scott. And uh, Jeff Tully doesn't really have a website, but uh, he's uh, he's all around the he's all around anyway. We see him all the time, and we're so glad to have you here as always, Jeff. Thank you so much. Always enjoy it. Uh, you can always find me, of course, at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv, and you can follow me on Twitter at avsforum. You can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv/htg. And on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geeks are scheduled to be Joel Silver and Mark Henninger, who are almost as we speak, finishing up this year's flat panel TV shootout at the CE Week event in New York City. And so we're going to learn about uh, the contestants therein and who won 
uh, we actually already know, go to avsforum.com. Right there on the home page, you will see the results of this week's, this year's uh, flat panel shootout. But next week, we'll be talking about it in quite a bit of detail. So I do hope you will join us for that. Until then, geek out. <laughs>